Hello, my name is Michelle Morand. I'm a precision cancer medicine educator and advocate, and I'm here with the cancer guy, Alexander Rowland, uh, and he's going to tell us today uh, about a way that you can uh, make sure that you're staying on top of the most current advancements for treatment. Alex, uh, sound, you're going to teach people how to fish today. Yes, we're going to talk about how to use um, our new RNA panel to determine if any new clinical trials or antibody drug conjugates are going to benefit, um, uh, benefit you or not. Yeah, and I understand part of what you're wanting to share today is not just how you and your team can do this for people, but how, like for years to come, people can do, uh, keep an eye on things and, and pay attention to new developments themselves. Yes. Well, the RNA panel covers just under 21,000 genes, and there's roughly almost 7,000 ADCs in development right now and yeah. clinical trials. So, yeah, by by all means, um, you know, this this is going to be able to allow patients to match to potentially, you know, thousands of drugs uh, over the years and, you know, determine whether a clinical trial is going to be a benefit for them or not. Yeah. All right. So tell us all about it. What is it okay. you, what do you want to teach us? Okay. So as you know, many of our patients like to do their own research. In fact, I get a lot of really great information from patients. Mm -hmm. um, they constantly send me things that, uh, you know, we're, we just can't keep up with. There's so many advancements and, you know, our entire team can't keep up with it. So literally every week, a new ADC comes out. And uh, if, you if you don't know anything about an antibody drug conjugate, and I suggest you do watch our videos on what antibody drug conjugates are, their latest and greatest development in cancer. I don't think we've ever had anything as good as uh, these drugs. They are basically a targeted form of chemotherapy that uh, works regardless of the genetic features of the cancer um, and only requires a person to have an overexpressed cell surface receptor or transmembrane antigen um, on their tumor cells that's highly overexpressed. Mm -hmm. uh, for those of you at home, there's a lot of terms that I'll just use. Please know that... Um... We'll teach you all about these things. We, we have a self-advocacy training program you can join. We're certainly just having a consultation with Alex. He'll go through all of these things with you. Make sure you know the terms that are going to be most specific to your type of cancer and the things you're going to want to look out for. Uh, but fundamentally, what he's just saying here, and I will make sure that um, some of those ADC videos he's talking about are linked in the description for this video, so you can find those really easily. Um, but it's the smallest little molecule of chemotherapy targeting a specific cancer cell as opposed to systemic chemotherapy, standard chemotherapy, which kills all rapidly reproducing cells or as many as it possibly can. Um, this, this is phenomenal in terms of getting the drug directly to the cells that need it. Minimal amount of the drug is required. Side effects are so minimal in contrast to standard chemotherapy and the benefits are just amazing really. And that's why this is so exciting and why there are literally seven plus thousand of these drugs in development right now. Yeah. I get so, so excited if, when I think about this. Yes. So if you, you are an investor and you missed out investing in Microsoft, now's your opportunity to invest in ADCs. Yeah. Or, or <laughs> I guess I should think about this too myself. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Let's get on with this thing. Okay. So um, typically a tumor RNA panel, um, as you know, DNA uh, we have DNA that look, we look for mutations in the DNA for targeted therapies. But um, the latest offering is an RNA expression panel. And RNA expression basically looks at an uh, intermediate um, between the DNA and the final protein product for different genes. RNA is basically like a transportation molecule, and it shares the DNA information to the um, translation and transcribing mechanisms um, that turn that DNA coding into a final protein. So basically, RNA is uh, just the coding that tells you what amino acids to turn to create the protein. So um, what we do is we look at the RNA from a tumor, and we count the molecules of RNA for each gene, and we have a panel that's just under 21,000 genes. So that tells us whether the gene is overactivated or not in the tumor compared to normal tissues. So step one, what do you do? Well, first off, um, you have to have the RNA expression panel. Um, you may have one from a different company. Um, if that's the case, that's fine. There's not too many of them around, but by all means, we should be seeing a lot of companies doing RNA panels in the, in the very near future. So um, ours is currently looking at 20,813 genes. And, and the reason for this, just so you know, in case you haven't seen all my other educational videos, 
uh, is when the Human Genome Project did its thing between 1999, 2003, um, this is the number of genes that were identified. Uh, so this is pretty much every gene that we know of in the human body um, that would be relevant in any way to your cancer at this time. Uh, yeah. And at the time that Alex and I are making this, it's 2024, in case you're wondering. Yes, so gene genome-wide really covers that. Uh, it de definitely tells you this is the entire genome almost. Mm -hmm. Okay, so next slide. So once you have this test, then what do you do? What you do is you start by looking at your test to report and identify any overexpressed genes. In other words, any genes that happen to be um, or cell surface receptors or antigens that happen to be um, higher in the tumor than they are normally in the cell type um, being compared to. Mm -hmm. So as Alex was saying earlier, the RNA, the, the cool thing, and for me, the cool thing about RNA is it's very highly conserved from region to region in the human body. So the levels that, that we're going to see um, in ovaries uh, are going to be consistent um, across all females. So um, when we start to see some shift in the levels of certain gene expression in that part of the body, we know that something fishy is going on there. Um, so yeah, yeah. that's that's really why this test is so helpful is once you know once you know what you should be seeing in all the different parts of the body for normal expression levels, then it becomes possible to test the relative expression. How much how much is showing up for you versus somebody without cancer? And that's how we can start to assess how involved is this particular gene in your cancer? Yeah, I think that's an excellent point, Michelle. Um, you know, one case, an example we have um, for our normal panel to determine what is highly overexpressed, we have a bunch of different normal tissues, about 40 different normal tissues. Um, we have three separate um, brain tissues, uh, three separate ones from three separate individuals. None of them had cancer. They're all very healthy. Um, and in each case, when we looked at the overexpression of the genes, they were within actually one or two fold of each other. So just remarkable to see how highly conserved RNA expression is across different tissues in humans. Yeah. And that's why this is the tool that pharmaceutical companies have been using since 2003 to design drugs, essentially. It's not mm -hmm. DNA testing that they use. It's RNA expression testing. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. I'm deal with that the while you carry on. Yes, great points, thank you. Okay, so um, you have your RNA panel. Um, this is a screenshot of the Excel sheet from the raw data. And so, you know, we provide the raw data for you. Um, this is, uh, and in, in the genes that we looked at were specific to this case, um, you can see we have MSLN. On the far left is the actual amount of um, MSLN RNA we found in the tumor. Uh, 67.4 per million pieces of RNA. So that's, and normally uh, you can see the next one in column C. So column A is the amount of the tumor. Column B is the name of the gene. And then column C is the amount in the normal tissue. In this case, what we should see. What we should see in ovarian. And normal ovarian, MSLN is not expressed. You can see zero. So this is why it's such a great drug to target or why it's such a good um, target because it's not in normal ovarian um, expression. Right. So, so this in this patient, particular case, yeah, this particular case, it was 67.4 fold higher than normal ovary. Right. It can be like five, five fold higher and yeah. be significant, right? It yeah, doesn't exactly. have, this, this is very significant at 67.4, yeah. but it doesn't, you know, any variance can matter. Yes, exactly. So this is telling us this is truly the Achilles heel of this cancer. Mm -hmm. And any person taking a drug that targets MSLN is likely to have significant benefits. Mm -hmm. So the next step, step three, is um, now that you have this, and you know we're, we're focusing on antibody drug conjugates, but this is true for any gene. Uh, in this particular case, what you want to do is you want to go to the brand new antibody drug conjugate database. There's actually a database for this um, created by... Uh, Creative Biolabs, wonderful database. Uh, it gives you tons of information. And, and in this particular case, I went to the search box and I just typed in MSLN. And this is what came up. And as you can see, I, I think there was about 40 drugs or so um, in development um, that target MSLN just by different companies and so on. They use different, um, you know, they all have their own way of doing it and they use different chemotherapy agents. 
But, you know, we're going to see a lot of these in clinical trials. In this particular case, I just took one drug, um, anatumab ravtensine, uh, also known as Bay 94-9343. And the reason I did that is because I have seen some clinical trials where um, it was getting significant benefits. So mm -hmm. I'm just picking that one. And then we're going to do a quick search on how to find that. So um, now we have that. Um, these anatumab ravtensine. It's a brand new AT ADC. It's been proven to be effective and to target MSLN. Now we have to find out where to get it. So we go to clinicaltrials.gov. And clinicaltrials.gov is the international database of clinical trials. It's got hundreds of thousands of clinical trials. It tells you where the clinical trials are. So if you're a cancer patient, you should really familiar familiarize yourself with this. Um, and make sure when you whenever you do a search, um, always look for trials recruiting patients um, because it will show you trials that are not yet recruiting patients or in development. I mean, sure, that, that can provide more options, but if you're looking for immediate you know, access to a drug, you want to click on the trials recruiting patients. So here's um, the front page, the search box. So what I did was I put recruiting um, I, and some not yet recruiting studies. Uh, I put in the name of it. You could also type in MSLN or ADCs, you could type in many different things. You could type in ovarian cancer, you could type in uh, the conditions, um, you know, other terms like MSLN. I just typed in the drug name here. And this will give us a list of all of the clinical trials using this drug right now. So uh, you can also click on the map function and that will show you where the locations of all these clinical trials are. And then you can click on the individual countries and it will give you a list of, of everything. Um, important thing to remember, whenever you go in a clinical trial, always make sure it's not blinded. So, you know, traditionally clinical trials will have what's called the double blinded, um, where, you know, the investigator doesn't know and the doctors don't know, and nobody knows who's getting the drug and who's not getting the drug. We don't need that anymore. That was something that was important in psychology trials. Um, but, and it's been passed on to medicine and everyone says, oh, this is a holy grail. That's just crap. It's not the holy grail anymore. Yes, it's nice to have an unblinded trial because then you know that no one's going to be corrupt, but really corruption is not a big issue here when it comes to drug development and clinical trials. Um, and more importantly, um, if it's not blinded, you could do better stratification on the patients. In other words, you can say, okay, well, what other markers did they have? What other DNA mutations did they have? So I am 100% against double blinded or any kind of blinded trials. I think, yes, you want to have a test control group, um, but you're going to get crossover anyways. If the drug works really well, it's not ethical to keep people on a placebo when everyone in the tested drug side of things is getting great benefits. It's not as ethical for data. You right. want to well, put those, those patients important. over. It's important to also note that when it comes to cancer, the, pl the placebo um, is standard care when you're talking exactly. about these types of things, because for yes. the very reason of the ethics Alex is mentioning, you can't withhold treatment. So at minimum, you would get the standard of care, but the whole point of doing this is you're wanting to get on the right drug. I also wanna just make a point, Alex is hyper-focusing in this particular video on clinical trials, but please know, um, some of these drugs are well through clinical trials and e easy to access without clinical trial. And I also want you to know clinical trials have really changed in the last decade. It is exceptionally rare that you will need to travel to take part in a clinical trial. Um, it's There's a wonderful database called Heal Mary that helps connect you and does all of the admin and legwork to, to get you into these clinical trials. And of course, we can help with that as well. Um, so... Uh, if you're kind of thinking, oh, clinical trials is experimental. No, by the time something gets to a phase two or three clinical trial, we know this drug works. Now we're just trying to assess dose more than anything. But again, a lot of these drugs are, are being fast tracked for FDA approval because we understand the mechanism of how they work so well. And we don't need to take years of clinical trials in order to understand that. Exactly, exactly. We have much more stratified populations in the trials. And so Thanks the, to the genetic smaller testing. amount of patients can produce a massive amount of very, very clear data. Mm -hmm. And yes, great, great to mention Heal Mary. What a wonderful service that is. Yeah, uh, I just love what they're doing. Um, definitely, if you want to look for a clinical trial, um, call Heal Mary. They'll give you lots of assistance. In it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So here's a map. And as you can see, it shows where all the clinical trials are, 12 in the States. Um, 
and then uh, five in Canada, um, and then seven in Europe, which looks about right. <laughs> um, typically, the States has a lot going on. Mm -hmm. So you can click on the individual countries, you can click on the topics, lots of ways to go into it, spend some time on this wonderful site. Um, and you can find lots of great information. RNA expression tells you which ADCs will work for you. So it's obviously the RNA expression of the target that the ADC is targeting. That's what you want to look at, not just general RNA expression, RNA expression of the specific molecular one. In this case, we're using MSLA, but there's many different um, targets now. This is one of the best ways to stay up to date on the latest drugs is to, is to you know, see what new ADCs are being made and then see if, if your cancer uh, overexpresses them. Because if it overexpresses them, then um, that drug's probably going to provide you with benefits. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, there's going to be people at home wondering about, okay, um, like, am I going to have to repeat this test or how, you know, let's say I get this test done um, now, um, how long is that data good for? Yeah, you know, and that's a great question. I don't know how clearly we can answer that because RNA testing in the clinical uh, circumstance is so new. But one thing we do know about cancers is cancers do tend to um, they're they're fairly consistent. In other words, by the time you get diagnosed with a you know with a cancer that's a, a tumor that's one centimeter, that tumor has all it needs to be able to um, grow, to change drivers. It's going to have all of the drivers right there up front. Um, and I heard it described in a really nicely way once. Um, think of cancer as a bus with a bunch of passengers and one driver driving down the highway. As the cancer is growing, the bus is driving down the highway. And so then we discover who the driver is, you know, let's say it's MSLN, and we hit it with a drug, and that causes the bus to pull over to the side of the road, and the driver will get out of the driver's seat, and he'll go down, and he'll become one of the passengers. And then after a while, one of those passengers will say, hey, I could drive this bus, and they get up, and they go sit in that driver's seat, they start at the bus, and they start driving. So then what we want to do is we want to find who that new driver is and, and target them. And so when we do tumor DNA and RNA expression testing on a primary tumor, we basically get a, uh, a manifesto of all of the passengers, and we know who they are, we know their names, and we know that any one of them can potentially be a driver at some point in time. And so, you know, we know that in advance. And so that's why it's really important that as soon as you get diagnosed, get an extensive diagnostics, spend the money on tumor DNA sequencing, HER2 testing, and a massive RNA expression panel. You won't have to keep doing that. Then all you need to do is just find out who that driver is. So you may only need to do a simple blood test that looks at one specific um, you know, protein that you suspect is going to be driving it. Um, and it's much easier. So really having those roadmaps up front allows you to avoid having to redo them over and over again, if you do them properly the first time. Now, if you get a limited DNA panel or a limited RNA panel, then you could use up all of your tumor sample and never be able to do it again. And so this is what another reason that I really urge people, as soon as you get diagnosed, don't do one or two tests, do a massive amount of analysis, get that DNA, get that RNA. And you know, the Doctors often say, well, that's not going to help you now. Well, sure, it may not may not help you now with everything that's there, but there's going to be things that will help you tomorrow and next week and next month and next year and 10 years down the road, because now you have that information. You don't ever have to look for it again. And from my experience with advocacy, I just want to touch on um, what Alex said Um about doctors saying it's not going to help you now. The more data you have up front, the more options you have because you have evidence to show what treatments are going to benefit you most. In standard of care in most countries around the world, we're still dealing with surgery, radiation, and standard uh, systemic chemotherapy. Um, and the reason for that largely is because um, those things will work to provide people some significant response one third of the time. So 
your government medical system is kind of hedging their bets that you might be one of those people. And, and so they start you on this. What We don't want that for you. And I'm sure you don't want that for you is to waste your time on a treatment that isn't ideal or the most beneficial or that you know might give you benefit for a couple of years, but there may be a drug out there that's gonna give you a complete response long term. Um, and that's what getting this type of testing done up front as, soon, as early in your diagnosis or as soon as you hear about it as possible can do for you is make sure that from the very start, you're on the absolute best treatment for those drivers of your cancer. And that all, all the data says that really helps to reduce any likelihood of recurrence and give you a longer period of time if there is to be recurrence. And of course, the side effects while you're on these treatments are um, overall significantly reduced over standard standard of care. So, um, you know, from the advocacy side of things, obviously, I'm always going to be urging people to make sure that they get the most thorough diagnosis up front, that they start out on the most targeted therapy program, and then they can use these blood-based monitoring tests that Alex is talking about to just keep an eye on, okay, what's, dri what's driving now? Are these emerging mutations you've probably heard about? Um, you want to be able to do that. The key is to have the evidence, the proof that your oncologist needs to be able to work outside of their standard menu. And without this type of data, they they literally can't, uh, which is why so often they might advise you, you know, start do what I'm telling you, essentially, because they don't have access to these tools right now. Well said. Yeah. So the RNA expression testing, there's other exciting treatment options that you can be matched to through RNA expression testing, by the way. It's not just ADCs, but Alex is really hyper-focusing on the ADCs right now yeah. um, because they are very new and very exciting. Um, uh, but RNA expression testing, again, it tells you a lot. You only need to do it once, and then you can do blood-based testing from there. Um, it looks at every gene in your body. So if you'd like to find out a little bit more about how to get this testing done, and you can join our self-advocacy training program, and I'll walk you through in more detail how, how to keep up with the latest and how to do your own research, um, which allows you to be really well-educated and have a lot of confidence in the treatment that you're on. And that's what's really important for the best outcome for you. And of course, if you'd like to have a chat with Alex, have him deep dive into your medical records and give you very specific guidance, uh, you can just follow that link and book in a consultation. I'm sure he and his team will have lots of excellent ideas for you. When I see the reports after these consultations, they always have you know at least two or three plus treatment options that they can recommend just in that consultation alone. In other words, um, there are more options right now, even without this test testing than you're currently being provided almost certainly. So mm -hmm. let's just get on top of this for you and find wow. out everything that can be known about your cancer. Make sure you're always on the best possible treatment. And that's what Alex and his team are here for. Yes. And I, if I could just uh, follow up with one more thing, the reason I'm so excited about ADCs is that they have an agnostic application and approval. Whereas a lot of the you know previous uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitors, TKIs that we were looking at over the years for targeted therapies, you know, they'll work in one cancer, they'll sort of work in another, maybe they'll work in another one. But with ADCs, it's across the board. I mean, they they have complete agnostic applications and they're getting agnostic approvals. Yeah. So you don't have to say, well, it's being used in breast cancer. It may or may not work in my cancer. It's going to be used in many cancers. Right. All you have to have is overexpression of that cell surface receptor. Right. So that's what Alex is talking about when he says agnostic approval. It means it's not specific to whether you have breast cancer or lung cancer or prostate cancer, as most of the prior drugs were. So uh, your doctor would have to agree to an off-label prescription historically if they wanted to prescribe you something that was otherwise for breast cancer. Um, in this case, these approvals are happening based on the molecular features or the MSLN thing and not whether you have breast cancer, prostate, lung, glioblastoma, or whatever it is. Um, so it's going to be much easier for you or us on your behalf to get doctors on board writing prescriptions because these things are approved for that molecular feature as opposed to the cancer type. Okay, well, thanks for sticking with us here. I hope this was really beneficial. Please uh, remember to subscribe to our channel so that you can stay informed. These types of videos are coming out from Alex and I every week. Lots of great information. And uh, do take the time to leave us a comment. Let us know um, what you thought about the video. And of course, reach out if you'd like our assistance.